Season 2024 has started in the AFL. Welcome back to Chat Shit. And this is the first of our weekly wrap-ups where we'll actually be talking about games of the season. About time. Yep. So it was round zero, uh, which was debuted this year. Uh, obviously for us as people in Sydney, we got to see some footy, so we think it was great. But we'd love to hear what you guys think because I think the Victorians, some of them weren't so happy. But we're going to start off today talking about what we thought were the top five performances from the round. Then we'll get into the games. And... Also, Supercoach starts this week, so our league code will be right here on the screen. Hungry Jacks again. And you should join because we'll have a good competition this year, and maybe we'll do something for the winner. P- potentially. Potentially. Maybe. maybe. Yeah, code was right there. It is 444322. Join in the next couple of days. I think, can you join once it starts as well? You can join once it starts. Yeah. yeah. But start working on your team. We've spent hours on it, but we're just going to jump straight in. And we'll be chatting about our teams later. Aiden, run me through your top five players of the round. Okay, so I'm going to go from five to one, but I'll start with some honourable mentions. So I've got two honourable mentions here. Harris Andrews, I've got as an honourable mention, just because the elite two and a half quarter performance that he had, um, a pretty lacklustre Brisbane defence, I'd say. We're going to jump into the analysis of the game soon, but he was exceptional mm-hmm. um, and marshaled Mackay and uh, Kerno quite well. Or incredibly well and probably if they had a four quarter performance he would have made the five and my honor, other honourable mention is Tom Green okay goal okay. 32 speaks for herself we'll talk about it later great player I'll jump into fifth I've put Harry Mackay actually okay and this is a little bit because of his kicking woes the last couple of years and he looks like he's he slayed his demons here I mean he's kicked the winning goal with a minute to go not an easy kick about 45 out, and he's kicked a couple other goals, and all round had a pretty good game. Came up the ground, took some really important marks. I was impressed, just based off what we've seen the last couple of years, and we've. I know personally, we've been known to make fun of him kicking. I'm I'm happy for Harry Mackay, but at the same time, like it, everyone seems to be quite shocked that a that a Coleman medalist can kick straight from 40 meters. It, but yes, yes, but based on the last two years, I was I was quite impressed with what I saw. No, it's good because he's gone through some serious woes. Number four, another guy who was probably the one person in the GWS team who could have been calling for a, for an axe last year was Callum Brown, mm. who kicked five goals. I'd say a bit out of nowhere because he was sort of. Uh, he was sort of in the squad last year, but not really as an impact player. He was sort of just there. He can go, he can bring down a contest, but he's come against the reigning premiers and he's kicked five goals. Mm-hmm. So performance pretty much speaks for itself. Huge. We'll unpack that a bit more when we go into the analysis. Uh, number three, I've got Isaac Heaney, who I read a stat somewhere. It was his best performance game he, he he's ever had or one of his top five games he's ever ratings. had. It was in player best ratings. Ever, best ever. Um, and that's not it. we were there uh, watching the game on before Thursday the play night. ratings came out I said it was the best game I've ever seen him play and we were begging begging for him to get at midfield time and maybe he's only got that because of the injuries to the Swans I reckon there's plenty of other things to get into with the Swans so I'll say this now I said straight after the game uh, doesn't matter how much depth we have in the Swans midfield when everyone's back when Adams, Parker, Mills and back you got Warner, Robottom, James Jordan uh, Matt Roberts going through there I don't care I want he- I want Isaac Heaney Angus Sheldrick un- Angus Sheldrick I want Isaac Heaney to be our number one midfielder I don't care who else is well, there he's definitely got to be rotated through there uh, a, a lot more than he was last year and I think we have enough firepower in our forward line tall and small that we don't need to rely on him up there and so we can put his talent into the midfield anyway number two I've got Matt Rowell, who had a career high 20 clearances, absolutely tore up a pretty lackluster Richmond team. I know we've talked about uh, the Richmond midfield getting absolutely smashed. They didn't look great, but still, you got to be there on the on the game day and you got to perform. A guy that we've seen not actually get too many touches historically. He usually gets maybe 15 to 20. Because what has um, as Kane Corns always criticises he can't get the ball on the outside. And, yeah, which it isn't a bad thing because his game, he was very mm. good at what he does. Um, but we saw him get, what, he got over 30 touches. 33. 20 clearances. Definitely deserve to be in the top five. And I've got him number two. Number one, I've put Brody Grundy. Uh, just got traded to the Swans, obviously. And he obliterated, I think that's the right way to put it, the number one Rockman in the competition in the last couple of years, a guy who who's kept him on the sidelines as well. Um, 
I know we expected big things from Brody Grundy, but I don't think we expected exactly what we were going to get, especially in this first game. Also, it's easy to say, having seen that performance, oh, he's a multiple-time All-Australian Ruckman. He was the best Ruckman in the league for a few years. But we haven't seen that for multiple years. That was a few years ago. So it's easy to say that having seen it now, but we did not know that we were going to get that version of Brody Grundy, but we've got it. And it was amazing. I've never seen a Ruckman dominate. The missing piece of the Swans. I thought Tom Hickey was good. Um, and now I've seen this performance. I know it's just yeah. one performance, and we'll see what has to come in the next few weeks. We'll get a, a proper read, but if that's anything to go by, I'm very excited for what he can do this season, and, and I think he deserves my best player of the round. And well, I'll get into mine, and you'll notice a few similarities, but I'll, I'll start off with my honourable mentions. To be fair, there weren't that many games to, to yeah, go by yeah, this yeah, round, yeah. so I wouldn't be surprised. Only only four games. Honorable mentions, I've got Charlie Kerno. Yeah, fair enough. He he was almost almost there. He did probably bring him back yeah. to life. Brisbane, we'll get into it, but to have made such a huge comeback and he was just very instrumental in that, just just dominating the forward line. I've got Nick Blakey in my honorable mentions. Fair enough. Uh we'll talk about Nick Blakey when we yeah. talk about the Swans because he's to jump into. a massive part of what the Swans are doing. But he was just he just tore apart the game at different times, just out of nowhere. In a, in a game that was very balanced for the most part until three quarter time, and then my third honourable mention is Ben King five scoring, goals. scoring five for Gold Coast, which was huge because he's a player that everyone like knows has this incredible potential. Sort of want him to take that next level, next he, step. Yeah, he has yeah. put it together for full seasons, but everyone knows he's still got that next step. Maybe with a team that's that's really firing, it could it could work in his favour. Into my top five, I've got Tom Green, who we've already talked about yeah. at number five. Yeah, awesome performance. One of the very, one of the Brownlow favorites. I think he's third favorite on the bookies list. That low? <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got some guy called Marcus Montempelli ahead of him. Damn. Anyway, at number four, I've got Brent Daniels. Okay, the four goal twenty two. Four goals twenty two. I love Brent Daniels. He's just one of those players, like a sort of like a smaller Will Haywood type. Just a guy that just plays an unselfish role. Uh, always puts in a hundred percent and uh, creates elite pressure in the forward line and. Just, it doesn't matter what stats he puts up, he's always going to have that impact and always going to be a valuable player for you. And I love to see players like that stack up the stack up the stats for themselves as well. And he got four and 20 disposals. It's huge. Yeah. And then my three, two, one were the exact same as you. Heaney three, okay. Raul two, and Grundy So it was one. a clear clear three. In the same order? In the same order. Same order in the yeah. same order. So we've talked about them already. We're going to jump into them a bit more when we go through the individual games. Yeah. Should we Should we go chronologically? Start off with, with Sydney, Melbourne? I mean, we were there. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's start on Thursday night. I'll let you kick us off here. So Sydney versus Melbourne was a huge game because you've got... The chat around Melbourne has been this chat about a potential huge drop off uh, due to stuff off the field as well as uh, as well as their disappointment on the field in finals over the last couple of years. Whether that would be a bit demoralising, always doing well in the regular season, and then and then since their premiership season being disappointing in the postseason. But what we saw, I think, was a good Melbourne team, but. The Swans just overran them in the fourth quarter. That's what I saw, at least. What was your perspective of that? Well, oh uh, yeah, definitely the first three quarters would look like there was still looked like a bit of a preseason game. It was a bit rusty. It was a bit wet. I know there were a lot of marks weren't taken. There was a lot of fumbles, and a sp- specific player Chad Warner came alive in the fourth quarter and probably mm. changed the game. But I want to give a shout out to the Swans' defense. I was skeptical um, at the start of the season with a 35 year old, I think Dane Rampey, maybe a bit younger. Um, Lewis Melican, who's I'd say still unproven. He's always been on the fringe of the Swans list as like a really good club guy, but has never really broken his way in as a regular guy. A 35 year old Harry Cunningham, um, Nick Blakey, we're very impressed by Ollie Florent off half back. Tom McCartan is, and, is and he, Tom McCartan's Tom McCartan. So I was I was a bit skeptical about how it was going to play out. I know Melbourne's had their forward issues, but. Uh, we, I think they had about 20 entries or something in the first two quarters and kicked up two goals or something like that. So they really held up. I'd be interested to see what happens when we come up against a taller forward line. I know I mentioned a little bit earlier, it'll be interesting when we play Gold Coast just because of the, the, the height in the forward line, Carlton as well. Um, but that's what really stood out to me. Yep. I'll mention two, because I know this will be very Sydney focused, also because they got the win, but the two standouts are or two mentions in Melbourne for me was Stephen May was elite down back uh, as he always is but he was he was really a, a problem at points in the game for the Swans entering 50 if they just went if any time they went too deep Stephen May just cleaned up the other one was it was great to see Clayton Oliver put in a good performance 
Uh, he didn't... Well, I jinxed I jinxed the Swans at one point saying, oh, Petrarca and Oliver, they're not having that impact they usually have. And then I think about 30 seconds later... I think but, it was less than 30 seconds. Yeah. It could have been 10 seconds. Petrarca just steals the ball and kicks kicks a goal from... Bursts out, bursts into a goal from 40 out, straight from a centre bounce. Um, so I, I jinxed them hard there, but Clayton Oliver had a good game and I hope he can just have a full consistent season because uh, he's just a great player to watch when he's at his best. But jumping to the Swans, the two things for me... Nick Blakey, we mentioned him earlier, but that I love seeing articles around the AFL now which are saying things which I have been believing for a long time, that this guy is already a top 15, top 20 player in the league and there's no one really like him in a lot of ways and he could really take the league by storm in the next five to 10 years of his career. What, uh, we were having a bit of a disagreement. Well, we had a bit of an <laughs> argument because we came out of that game together. We walked out and he immediately said, Nick Blake, he's a top 10 player in the league. I said it during the first quarter, actually. During the fir- okay, sure. During the first quarter, which probably broke out into a 30-minute argument about <laughs> I was listing players that are most definitely above him. But I we came to an agreement. Or we did, came to a, I came to an agreement that he was in the top 20 and we agreed to disagree that we weren't going to agree on anything. Um, but yeah, he was... One of the standouts in that game. I want to give a mention to Jack Viney as well, who, who was quite impressive. Um, I think the main part was definitely Brody Grundy. Yeah. Um, especially what we saw when when Brody Grundy was off the ground, the domination that Max Gorn was able to get over McLean. But a big thing that I noticed in the game was actually the Swans players just all getting into Max Gorn. Um, I know that some other analysts have said that whenever any player walks past, whether it could be Heaney or any other midfielders, any defenders, whenever they were near Max Gorn, they just give him a bump or a bump here here and there. And we saw him play a, quite a, a substantial amount of time on the bench. And he looked a little bit unfit. Um, he did. He got outworked by Brody Grundy around the ground. I didn't see that usual Max Gorn taking marks on the wing, especially the ball was went towards him quite often. And we didn't see him taking those pack marks, really stabilizing Melbourne, getting those re-entries. Um, a lot of that is just Brody Grundy. A lot of it was Brody Grundy, but I think the the tactics up against Max Gorn as, a, as an entire team were bang on. I think other teams, that's a blueprint against Melbourne. If you can nullify Max Gorn, I feel like you've got a very good chance against Melbourne. And Brody Grundy showed some pretty concrete tactics, like moving early when the umpire throws it up and just getting yourself in front of him, just getting your back to the chest of Max Gorn. And I didn't see, he did that throughout the match really successfully. I didn't see Max Gorn provide any sort of counter tactics, which was a bit surprising to me because he's such a proactive and intelligent player. So I'll, I'm, I reckon they'll they'll cook something up in the Melbourne training grounds. And so I don't, don't know if that'll be as effective the next time someone tries it, but Brody Grundy definitely laid a br- uh, blueprint. Yeah, uh, so be good to see what the Swans do next week against Collingwood. Massive game on Friday night. All right, let's move on to the next game, Carlton-Brisbane. 46 mm-hmm. points the difference was. Um, Brisbane were up by. They look to be cruising, especially at the Gabba where they haven't lost in what, a season and a half, maybe even more. Um, it looked like it was going to be a huge blowout, and then we just saw something switch. Carlton came out with a bit of energy in the third quarter, came back and ended up winning a game by one point of Harry McCarr's boot. Mm. How did you see it? That was just an amazing game. That any script writers in the AFL front office would have just been... That's try, the, that's, try and do better than that's that. That's their wet dream right there. That was an ideal game of footy to get that eyes... That is a short right there. <laughs> to get eyes on the footy uh, heading into official round one. <laughs> but sure. um, it was it was really, really awesome. Brisbane are a team that you, you really feel undeniable at the Gabba generally, but especially like 46 points up, just coming into the season as premiership favourites. They were cruising yeah. in that game. And it was uh, it was amazing to see because Carlton, have, there's been some split opinion. Everyone knows that they're going to be good this year, but there's been split opinion as to whether are these guys up there with the real premiership favourites or, or are they just going to show flashes? And they show that they've got some really special stuff over there. Well, uh, there were some negatives to come out of the game. We saw two ACL injuries. Yeah. Sam Doherty doing his third ACL. Um, Do- Doherty. Doherty, that's what I said. Doherty. Doherty, okay. Uh, did his third ACL and Kitty Coleman did his ACL mm. as well after having a massive grand final. Was expected to, to blow up even more than last year off half back. A big talking point is who's actually going to replace him back there. Yeah, I'm, we're hearing Dane Zorko might step into the half back just as, as the leader of the team to, to just try to shore up that 
that position where they've got pretty no pretty much no experience. Well, no one there's no one like Kitty Coleman in that Brisbane team that's that's no. going to really bounce rebound them back off half back. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they they'll do. I'm, I'm sure Chris Fagan will cook something up. Um, yeah, and we just hope for a successful recovery for both of them. Cause yeah, because that's that's, that's a terrible injury. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get two in one game as well. Uh, Coleman's was was quite bad, but Doherty um, looked quite innocuous actually. He he sort of stood up, looked like he tweaked something, kept running a bit, and then went off. Um, so yeah, really unfortunate to see. Um, I was happy that we saw saw the best of Carlton. Um, 46 points down, you can easily sort of wash away there, just try and damage control, maybe not lose by 80 or 90 points, especially when you've got a massive Brisbane home crowd who were singing Country Road when Charlie Cameron kicked the goals. I reckon they weren't believing it. They were, It was just happening, and then eventually they were probably like, oh, we're three goals away here. I reckon when you're 46 down against Brisbane, you're just like, we'll give it our best shot here and put up a good account of ourselves, but you're not believing you can win that yeah, game. Yeah, and then... The Anyone who says that, goal, I, don't, I don't trust you. Win after another goal, after another goal, after another goal, and suddenly they were ahead. Mm. Uh, maybe the start of the fourth quarter or something, then it went, the leads kept changing and changing and changing. As we saw, Harry Mackay apparently has found his kicking boots and, and kicked the sealer. So yeah, I'd be interested to see what Brisbane do this season. Obviously put a very good account of themselves in the first half and, and really struggled in the second half to keep going. Um, we'll move on to the next game um, where we saw Gold Coast versus Richmond. Mm. Another game where there was a huge margin, a little bit of pushback, but not quite the, the comeback we saw in the previous game. I reckon Gold Coast has been the team in this preseason that has had the most interest about where they'll finish. You have people predicting them to be in the top eight, and you have people saying, what are you talking about? This is still a team that is around 14th, 15th, just above those, those bottom feeders. Uh, Damien Hardwick had a lot of expectation on him and really delivered in that first half or at least the, his players delivered in the first half they scored 12 or 13 goals in a row and they were just really dominant in that midfield what we've known of Gold Coast and what they've been building over the last couple of years with their personnel is they have some absolute tough nuts in that midfield and they've now got some depth in there now that they've discovered that Sam Flanders can play in there and Matt Rao seems to be becoming well it's one hell of a midfield I mean oh, they got yeah. Wits who was a top ruckman yeah They've got Anderson, who I think might make All-Australian this year. Yep. They've got Rao, who had an awesome first game. Mm-hmm. They've got Flanders, who's just a ball magnet. And then the leader, Tuke Miller. And they've got Tuke yeah. Miller, who's the, the best one of the best ball. two-way, if not the best two-way runner in the league. Yeah, this the guy that just doesn't stop. He's physically skillful, and he's just going to run all day and do everything for your team. So if it looks like they've got... Gold Coast have a balanced team now. They've been developing as well. Guys at the back, you've got Sam Collins and Charlie Ballard, one of the really elite key back combinations in the league. They have runners coming off the halfback line. Sexton reinventing himself. Absolutely. And now that it looks like they've got some firepower in that forward line, hopefully a full season of fit Ben King and Jack Lukosius, who's over the last couple of years developed into a, a pretty, pretty consistent almost key forward um, who knows what they can do they seem to have balance all over the ground and now with an inspirational and successful coach uh, it's a really really exciting I know that my power rankings don't reflect everything that I'm saying we'll see um, later though the updates yeah but we'll also yeah we'll, we'll see so we'll see later we'll see later but let's move on to the well just just yeah, one more I'll, thing I think yeah. what's what's interesting about Gold Coast is I feel like every year it's almost is this their year that they can finally push for finals mm. and really make an impact on the league and it's always seen that after eight to ten rounds they sort of haven't done that so I guess they played a very we'll say an awful Richmond uh, mm. in round zero it'll be interesting to see what they do in the next few weeks if they can really back up a performance and if they're real contenders to make that top eight yeah I'd say on Richmond quickly their midfield was really bad they have on paper good personnel in the midfield but it just doesn't mesh well at all it's like when you've talked about um, at points over the last couple of years when Bulldogs midfield hasn't meshed well but a lot a lot worse where you have uh, like it was mainly Taranto Prestia and Hopper in there with not as much rotation as you'd like when you compare it, something I wanted to mention with the Swans that we didn't mention was how many players were rotated through the midfield regularly. I think the first two centre bounces, it was four different players, the two yeah. centre bounces, yeah. and it was it, which was pretty crazy, like including the Rockman. And in Richmond, you saw a pretty stale midfield where there was it was not very dynamic, and they didn't seem to go well together. Well, I think one thing they've got to do is they've got to get Bolton in there, a hundred percent. They've got to get uh, him playing less forward time and get the ball moving. Um, which was a huge, a huge problem for them yesterday. I think we'll move into the last game now. I'd say I wouldn't say the game before the, the round started would have been the game of the round. Um, 
potentially predicted first, first, second here. Um, I'll let you kick us off because I know you were big on this game. Yeah, I've got in my notes Sam talks up GWS because I've been talking up GWS all preseason. They are, in my mind, the premiership favourites. The I think they're the best team in the league. I just think they have balance everywhere. They seem to have a coach that has them all believing that they're, that they're a strong team and that they're a team that can do it. And the one, you know, the most notable thing for me about this GWS team that separates them from last year and the year before where they've been good their forward line does not rely on Toby Green anymore. They've had a strong defense and a strong midfield over the last couple of years. A defense and a midfield that's getting better with the development of guys like Sam Taylor and Tom Green. But now in that forward line, you had Brent Daniels kicking four goals, Callum Brown kicking five goals, a young gun in Aaron Cadman who's starting to show that he can be a really solid contributor. And then Toby Green just kicks a goal and has obviously played a great game, but... They weren't relying on him like we've seen them really rely on Toby Green in the forward line. Well, I think the biggest problem for teams coming up against GWS now is it's not just the focus on Toby Green. The problem is there's there's players who can hurt you from anywhere. I think it's not just if Toby Green gets the ball, damn, I've got a problem here. It's Brown gets the ball, now he's suddenly a good kick. I think he kicked one from 60. Mm. He kicked um, one from another couple from tight angles. Yeah, he's really strong. Uh, if Daniels gets the ball, we've got a problem. And that was not to mention Jesse Hogan. Jesse Hogan, who was relatively quiet opposed to the others, but still what we saw last season, I'm sure he's going to kick on. But yeah, they got a, we got a real problem in GWS this year. Um, I thought besides Toby Green and Jesse Hogan, their forward line might have been a little bit of a weakness. Uh, as opposed to the strength of the defence in midfield. But after that performance against the reigning premiers, um, ominous signs Yeah, I wanted, GWS. I wanted to say with Collingwood, everyone knows that when you're thir- 20, 30 up against Collingwood, or if you're up against Collingwood heading into that third quarter maybe, or into that fourth quarter, you're thinking pretty much every time this happens, Collingwood makes a comeback, or they at least scare you, but they'll probably beat you mm. uh, with what's happened over the last couple of years. GWS got that lead, and then they just built on it and they just ran over and stampeded this Collingwood team. And Collingwood, you didn't, GWS just didn't allow us to see that seeming extra source of energy that Collingwood have in that fourth quarter. And it was it was very impressive. I don't think I don't think we've seen that against that Collingwood. Well, they this prevented Collingwood, this Collingwood from being fluent with the mm-hmm. ball movement. I know Nick Dacos still got his, his 30 something, he's still got a goal. But besides that, we really didn't see, we didn't see we do anything um, at all through the middle. We saw a very little ball movement, um, which which was a big reason why GWS ended up probably dominating most of the game. Um, a big issue for Collingwood might be their forward line, which didn't do too well when the ball came in uh, with the high entries. I think they, they were more successful when the ball, when the the, forward, the midfielders lowered their eyes and looked for the targets. Um, just to do with the key forwards uh, injuries in mixed day. Could be an issue to watch out for, but then again, we'll see what Collingwood does in the next few weeks. I do also think there might be these... Collingwood, I don't think they'll believe in person, personnel issues this year with what's with how they've operated over the last couple of years, which built to a premiership. I don't think they care about personnel. They just have their identity, and it doesn't matter which 22 players are on the, or which 18 players are on the ground. They play with that identity, and I don't think they'll have big worries. I think they'll say, hey, we can bounce back. We'll just learn from that. So... Uh, it, it, we could we could see if it if it piles on a little bit more, but I reckon for now Collingwood won't be worried at all. What did you what did you think of round zero? Oh, just as a concept. As a concept, yeah. Oh, I haven't thought about it too much because I'm not complaining. Oh, I wish I had my Richmond versus Essendon game at the G on a Friday night to start us off. Richard Carlton. Yeah, of course. But I uh, I really I enjoyed it, but a little bit indifferent. What did you think? Well, I know in every coach uh, post match interview it was always ah. Oh, they always mention round one, so I don't think they've even wrapped their head around it because round one's next week. But I like it, it, especially with the games that we got. We got the one point, and we got a very close game until the fourth quarter in Sydney versus Melbourne. We got to see a showing from Gold Coast. We got to see the reigning premiers get hammered mm-hmm. um, by GWS. It's really got the excitement going for the season, so I think it was a positive. And I think if we're looking at it in the bigger picture, this was a commercial decision by the AFL, not a decision about the competitiveness of the league. And so... The decisions that the AFL have been making recently about commercial decisions have been extremely successful. The league is thriving more than ever, and uh, I think we we should give the AFL some leniency to to make these decisions because they're doing pretty well at it. Yeah, the only negative we can say is that the the buys throughout the season are going to be different for teams instead of just having those like three rounds where teams have buys. 
Um, but I guess we'll move on to our weekly power rankings uh, mm-hmm. brought to you by Sam over here. Okay, well, obviously only eight teams played, so I feel bad for the teams that are going to move down despite not playing. And uh, congratulations, good performance by the teams that will move up despite having not played. But, okay. Yeah, get a bit closer. Get a bit okay. closer. However, the teams that did play, the ranking, uh, the ranking changes might be quite dramatic because these initial rankings were having not even seen them in the home and away season. So now that we've seen them, they could, they could. There's going to be quick changes at the start of the season. Yeah, and just while again, we figure out what's if going you on. haven't seen this segment before, this is power rankings based on form and vibes, mainly vibes. Okay, let's start at the let's start at the bottom this time, and the first team we see that played is Richmond. And mm, that's almost what we expected of them. They were down at 14th anyway, but they didn't impress the way that they just got bulldozed through the midfield. I'm going to move them below Hawthorne to 15th. I'll keep them above So is that still above Frio? Still above Frio. Yeah. We haven't seen how Frio are going to play, but I think they still have to prove something there. If we, we go up to Gold Coast now, who were in 12th, and yes, they impressed. And while these other teams haven't had a chance to prove themselves... I'm going to move Gold Coast up to 10th above Geelong and the Bulldogs. Moving on to the top eight, which is where a lot of the teams that played come from. Yep. You've got Melbourne, who were in seventh. And I was, okay, I'm not going to do it, but I was saying to Aiden as a joke, just because I'm so happy with how the Swans played. I say, you know what? Melbourne, they should go up in the power rankings for having minimized the damage because they, they still played well not to not to be rampaged by the Swans. But I don't think that's quite the case. They they weren't the dominant team that we've seen them be. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep them at seventh though. I'm gonna I think Swans played really well. It's difficult to be the Swans at the SCG. Carlton were obviously extremely impressive and this is where we make our first big change. Ooh. We're gonna drop St Kilda to six for now. We'll drop Sydney all the, there's still changes to be made, but Carlton is going to go up to number three. Three. That's a big jump. It's a big jump. It's early do- early doors to the season. Okay, let me put let me put let me put Carlton in four. Let me put okay. Carlton in four. Okay, he- hear me out. Then the Swans come, and geez, the Swans were impressive. There were with seeing the impact that Brody Grundy's going to make, and I think seeing how our team operated despite not having three of our best midfielders in there. I'm thinking the vibes are extremely high. Sydney go up from four where they were to two. And I'm putting the Brisbane Lions in three and Collingwood in five. Collingwood in five. Collingwood in five. I think, as we've discussed, I think the four teams ahead of Collingwood, or especially GWS, Sydney, and Brisbane, I think are teams where I believe they have a system that can be the best system in the league. Whereas I don't necessarily think that is the case for Collingwood. I don't think it was the case last year. I think they won through having a solid system and pure effort, belief. fitness, belief, and determination, winning so many tight games, I think that's really, really hard to do sustainably. I still think they have a great chance to win. Obviously, I have them fifth in the power rankings, but I think these three teams above them have have a better system, and I think Carlton as well were just so impressive against Brisbane. You have to reward them with this. That's, that's my power rankings for now, and obviously GWS stay at one. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they change when that, we that's actually, what we've got. We get to the regular season again, and we actually can. Oh, this is the regular season, but where everyone, where all the teams actually play. Yeah, and we'll probably we'll see more changes in the power rankings. I reckon once we see more teams playing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let emergence. us know what you think of the power rankings if you disagree at all. But yeah, we're just gonna go in again like we did last week into a chat about Supercoach, which is now is we're a few days away now. The Supercoach season's actually starting. By the time this video comes out. The Supercoach season will be starting in two days. Two days, yeah. And you should join our league, and it'll be good fun. Aiden's in his first year, as we've discussed, and I want to hear what you're thinking going into round one. Well, there's been a lot of change um, <laughs> recently, um, and I'm I'm not sold on my on my premiums yet. Who they're going to be? I'm sort of shifting between quite a few. I'm pretty heavy on my midfield at the moment. A lot of my cash is spent through there, and I'm also having a lot of issues with the bench players at the moment um, there's a lot of young guys this season I feel that they are primed for inc- an increase in value and I can't exactly wrap my head around who to pick mm. uh, Matt Roberts is someone that that's a lock for me now after seeing him in the game but there are guys like Darcy Wilson Manor Jai Clark um, Naismith as the, as the rock bench 
So yeah, there's just a lot of guys who I can't exactly choose between. Those that's that's my struggle at the moment. I'm not going to chat too much about my team. We'll we'll talk more about it once the season starts. But the one guy I'm going to mention as a bit of a hidden gem that I think I wouldn't mention this guy if we had say if we had 20k viewers, I wouldn't mention him because I wouldn't want to give it, give it away to too many people. But Jared Lyons, I'm not seeing many, some of these super coach YouTubers. I'm not seeing a lot of people who do well picking Jared Lyons. This is a guy who was one of the top super coach midfielders two years ago. I don't think he's gotten much worse. I think Brisbane played a certain system last year uh, and having picked up Dunkley, where Jared Lyons was the natural guy that fell out of the side. But when he plays, he's a guy that averages 27, 28 disposals, gets tackles, is pretty efficient with the ball and gets contested possessions. And I think will rack up super coach points. So if he gets picked for round one and I get the feeling or I hear something that he's going to be securely in the side for a few weeks. This guy's a lock in my team at 258k. Very cheap. As a guy that I think could has potential to play as a 600k player. So I think that that's the very ceiling except I think that's really possible if he gets consistent game time. I'm really looking forward to to getting getting started. Um, the code again is 444322 right here. Thanks again for watching uh, this week's episode of the podcast and we'll see you on the next one.